video, we have part one of a two-part series that discusses in detail how to measure liner projection, also known as liner protrusion, how to prepare your cylinder block for cutting counterbores, how to cut counterbores, and also measure your cut and install liner shims. So what we have here is a 6NZ C15 cat with a blown head gasket. There it is right there with the cylinder head already removed. You can see that the fire rings are damaged, but some of them are completely destroyed. This number five's starting to show carbon passing. Number four, completely blown apart. Typically this means, almost all the time actually, that you have a sunk liner. This is not just a problem for cat engines. Cummins Detroit can also have these problems. Pretty much any cylinder block that uses wet liners. So what happens is the liner actually sinks into the block. The only way to fix this correctly is to cut four counterbore shims or to put a steel insert, but that requires a machine shop. So what we're going to be doing here is measuring liner protrusion first. On a CAT C15, install your spacer plate gasket and you need one to six thousandths protrusion with the spacer plate installed. Now, Monaco Tools was nice enough to send me this liner protrusion gauge for making this video because I couldn't find the one that we're supposed to have in the shop. Very nice tool here. We're also going to be using a Monaco Tool counterbore cutter. So what we're doing here is all you're going to do is measure how much protrusion the liner has out of the spacer plate. This one has minus five thousandths protrusion. Now the specification is one to six thousandths in the positive. So this is way below specification and this is why the fire ring is damaged. This is a very common problem on wet linered engines, particularly C15s. We're also going to measure here and we have minus two thousandths. So basically at this point, which I already knew these had sunk liners because of the blown head gasket, but we know these are definitely sunk. So I've got a little time lapse of what you have to do next. Obviously you have to pull the cylinder packs out. I decided that pulling the pistons and then removing the liners is easier than trying to use the combo tool that pulls the piston and liner at once. More times than not, it actually won't pull the whole assembly. So you end up having to separate them anyway. So I just kind of skip that step now and disassemble them. It is lighter that way also. So this is actually the beginning of the liner protrusion, or I should say counterbore cutting process, it starts now. Now you might be saying, well, don't you have to clean the deck? Yes. Now I also pulled this dowel pin here, but you can see where the liner sits, that ring right next to the liner bore. That's where the liner sits and that's where it wears. And that's also where we're going to be removing material. Now the reason I say that it starts now is because there's a correct way and an incorrect way to prepare your block for installing your counterbore cutter. And I just wanted to show you this. These packs, obviously there's rust on them, but they all had very heavy cavitation on the exhaust side of the engine. All of them were in this single line right on the exhaust side. Very weird. Um, most likely due to poor coolant. So here's what you're gonna need. Not a die grinder. Do not use a die grinder for cleaning decks. Proper way is mostly just scraping it and then you can use some light sanding or a, even a sharpening stone, something like something flat and because you don't really want to remove material off the deck. The deck should be flat already. What you're just trying to do is clean it and get it as flat as possible without removing the machining marks that help keep the gasket in place and hold a good clamp tight on the gasket. So all I'm doing here is I'm scraping. I usually spray it with, uh, uh, this is penetrating oil. I'm putting that in the bolt holes. You also wanna tap the head bolt holes and clean them out as best as possible. And I'm scraping here. I, I do three different passes with scrapes, depending on how dirty the deck is. And then I'll usually run a uh, that flat sander there just real quickly. So this is after one scraping and spraying it down. You can see how much cleaner it is. This is just one scraping. I, no power tools, I do this all by hand. It's easy to mess up a deck, but just don't go crazy. You don't need power tools to clean an engine block, really. 
So now I'm gonna finish my second scrape. I usually use solvent. I'll just spray solvent out of like a brake clean canister and just leave it on there. Really works good. And then when you wipe it down, it'll, it'll clean the deck properly. So once that's done, then I'll just clean it up some more. And here we go. It's been sanded. This is what your deck typically will look like if it's prepared properly. You can see the keyway marks. And what we're gonna do is actually measure that it's flat. You want this as flat as possible. Remember you're going to be machining and you need a very flat, clean surface to take your measurements for. If you use a die grinder, you're gonna get high and low spots and you're gonna get a not great result. So once it's properly prepped, you're pretty much ready for getting the rest of the block prepared. Now remember I said you need to clean the head bolt holes. I always re-tap every bolt hole and typically use penetrating oil, then I'll vacuum out the remnants of any debris, rust, molybdenum paste that's in the bolt holes. It's very important, not only for installing your new head bolts, but also for when you use the counterbore cutter. It uses the head bolt holes to hold it in place, so it's very important. Now earlier I had mentioned that the specification is one to six thousandths for these Cat C15s. That's if you're not using shims. If you are using shims, which we will be using, the specification is actually three and a half to six thousand, so you have a much tighter window. So that makes this block prep even more important. Now remember, this is only on Cat C15 engines. Every different engine, even Cat different engines, have different specifications. If you're working on a Cummins or a Detroit, you need to see what their line of protrusion measurements need to be. So we are now prepared. I use these brake chamber uh, plugs Diaphragms is what they are, and they work great. They fit right in the cylinder. They'll catch pretty much any metal that was going to fall in deeper into the engine. Now, obviously, the pan's off. I've also installed earplugs in the oil ports on the rod, um, rod journals on the crankshaft because you don't want to get any metal in there, obviously. So this is our Monaco counterbore cutter. Well, that's the box, at least. This is the actual cutter itself. Very nice tool. I've, I've used the, uh, there's a cat branded one also and a cat pneumatic one. And I've had much better luck with this one than the cat one. Now, in defense of the cat one, it had been used and abused for a long time before I ever got to use it. I also like to keep the cutting head off of the machine when it's not in use. And there's our bit. You can see the bit needs to extend past the cutting, uh, widest part of the cutting channel there. And then we're going to install that and then install our counter bore cutter. Now the counter bore cutter is a very simple machine and very precise. So you obviously you don't want to drop it. You don't want to manhandle it. Um, if something's binding up or something, just stop and either get it repaired if you need to or get it, get it to work properly. It's really just a slow turn cutting unit with a cutting bit. And it does not come with these style head bolts. It comes with a different style bolt, but I use the head bolts so I can use a 3.8 drive because uh, the cat head bolts are a 12.3 uh, quarter. The normal bolts that come with, I believe, are a one inch or inch and an eighth. Now I'm going to be cutting number two cylinder first. And the reason I'm doing that is because number one's harder to cut because it's right up against the front structure. So it, when you rotate the cutting head, the arm will hit the front structure. So if you start with two, it actually makes this go a little easier because typically once you get set up, you don't have to reset after the initial time. So all I like to do is run the head bolts in here. You could use a very low torque impact to run these in or a drill. I like to do it by hand generally. It doesn't take that long. Now, if you had not cleaned out the head bolt holes, this would be a total pain in the butt. You could also potentially damage the threads on the bolts or in the bores themselves. Also, this is gonna throw a lot of metal around, so it's very important that if the bolt holes were not clean, that metal might get trapped in those holes. Uh, you also see me using a, an, a pneumatic vacuum in this video. Obviously, you don't have to use a pneumatic vacuum, but I do recommend using a vacuum, not just like a magnet or something. This will throw a lot of metal everywhere. Like I said, any airports, oil ports, you can plug off, try to. Also, this is a small oil port. I generally put several drops of clean, unused 15W40 in this machine every time I use it. I've found if you do not lubricate it every time, it can actually affect your cut and you might not get a 
clean square cut. So always lubricate it. Now this is how you use the machine. There are two lock collars on this machine. There's the bottom lock collar and each have a thumb tightening tack and the top lock collar. The bottom lock collar is more important. It is what sets your cut depth on the cutting head. The top one is just your stop. So basically what you're gonna do and what I'm doing here is as you move the bottom collar up, it'll move the cutting head down. If you watch slowly, you actually see this, but if you use the machine, it makes more sense. So the way it does that is it's in contact with a brass bushing on the top of the purple portion of the machine there. And the call, the bottom collar is, it forces the cutting head up or down depending on where it is. So that's actually how you change your cut depth. So this will make more sense as I do the cut. Basically, once we're set up, now remember I haven't torqued these bolts. You need to torque the bolts to 30 foot-pounds before you start your cut. Now typically what I'll do is I'll get it set up, I'll rotate it a few times until it's actually contacting the block before I generally uh, torque the bolts because it can bind up if you don't have it perfectly centered. It's not self-centering. So as you can see, it's rotating freely. I like to, there's our cutting bit. So once it's set up properly, you can see there it was rotating freely. I like to hand tighten it, make sure it spins freely. And then all we're gonna do is torque it to 30 foot-pounds. And I like to rotate the handle while I'm torquing it. Now you might see there's some real light metal shavings there. That's because when it's when I do when you do that first little cut, well it's not even a cut, it's it's really you're just you're cleaning up that portion of the block. You're not really cutting into it very much. And you should have 30 foot pounds. I like to rotate it when I torque it. So now we're all set up. We're actually ready to start cutting. Before you cut though, start making your first cuts. Like I said, the first cuts need to be like a shaving cut. So all you're doing is you're getting a uniform square, uh, kind of like a surface finish on the top. You're not trying to remove material, although it might shave a little bit off. So once you have that and it's torqued down, what you're gonna do is you're going to lock the bottom collar. You, you never wanna start rotating actually with the bottom collar not locked because if you do, it'll start digging into the block. So we're, we're really set now. Now, we're, this is where the top portion comes in. Now there's dashes on the bottom and the top collars. Each dash is roughly one thousandth of an inch. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna get a, whatever size feeler gauge you want the cut depth to be to. I try to cut to 29 thousandths. And the reason I do that is because the smallest shim Caterpillar makes for these engines is a 30 thousand shim. The part number for that is 6I4361. You can get them up to over 200 thousandths of an inch if you need to cut that deep. But I like to cut as shallow as possible and use the smallest shim as possible. So we have our 29 thousandths feeler gauge here. I have a bent one, but it doesn't have to be bent. It could be straight, it doesn't matter. And all you're gonna simply do is insert it between the bottom collar and the top collar. Remember your top collar is your stop. So this is, you are determining now your cut depth with the feeler gauge. Run it tight, not super tight. You need to be able to remove the feeler gauge and then lock your top collar. You should not move your top collar at this point. The top collar should stay where it is. This, if you were to move it, you would cut too shallow or too deep. This is very accurate. You will be within one thousandths of whatever the feeler gauge you put. That's why I don't put thirty thousandths also, because if you're slightly over, then you might have to go to the next size shim. Now is the fairly tedious process of actually cutting the counter bores. So I like to cut generally at one thousandths at a time. And the, the way you do that is you loosen your bottom collar and move it back one tick at a time. That is one thousandths per time. So you will end up doing this and resetting on these 29 times. Now the good part is the machine has already been set up for this particular engine now. So you should not have to reset it on the next cut. All the cylinders, and I'm cutting all six as Cat recommends, will be getting cut to 29,000. So all I really should do 
is leave the top collar where it's supposed to be, remove the machine, clean the block of the metal shavings, and then reset our bottom cutting head back to zero, and away you go. The stop should stay in place, and they should cut to 29 thousandths each time. I've used this machine probably for eight different engine rebuilds, and it, it has not failed me yet as far as it staying consistent on the cuts. Now I'm using this pneumatic vacuum. Obviously you don't have to use a pneumatic one, but it works really well. I, I highly recommend the vacuum though, not just the magnet or something. There were metal shavings everywhere here. And generally I'll go through and vacuum about every 10 passes, so about every 10 thousands. Do you have to do that? No, but I don't like to let the metal accumulate too much. I concerns me that it may get under the cutting head. Also, you don't want to stop the cutting head in the same place each time. If you do that, you can develop little lines in that spot. So try to stop it at different points. So this is what we're cutting here. Uh, we're roughly, I believe, about 10 thousandths deep now. And we're just going to be moving it deeper until it comes up against the stop. Now, nice thing about this machine, you can measure your cut depth in two places with this machine if you have the right depth mic or that liner protrusion measuring gauge that I had there, the sled gauge that Monaco had sent me. You don't have to use theirs. I do like theirs. Cat makes their own. It has a much smaller base, which can be nice, but at the same time, it's not quite as stable. So like I said, we're just resetting our cut depth. Now I have cut before in 2000s increments, but like I said, I find it's a lot easier if you just move it 1000s at a time. You get a lot less chattering. It's easier to push the machine through its cutting paces. And it, in general, it'll give you a better finish in my experience. So we are pretty much up against it right now. Obviously I've cut out a little section of me just moving the thing back and forth but we should be at about 29 thousandths right now. So this, there is a stop also on the cutting head. You can pick it up and move it out of place and it'll stay in position. It's a pretty nice feature. So before you do your first measurement, you wanna sand the areas you're gonna measure because it'll create a small ridge and it'll give you a false reading. It'll be artificially low. So hopefully we're at 29. Look at that right on the money. So at this point, you need to remove your machine and then measure it in four places. Look at that, 29 thousandths. It actually measures 29 thousandths in four corners. So it is a good square cut. That means I can move on to the other cylinders and cut all six. This is what the liner shims look like. They're fairly expensive, about $80 each. They're also directional. Part numbers need to face up because the bottom sections have a bevel. Very important to check them also that they fit. If not, your bit may have not have been cutting wide enough. This is the end of part one. Thanks for watching.